Hey, everybody. Just everyone, let everybody get connected to the call here. All right, great. So we're gonna we're gonna get started here. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody back for our uh, club tasting for In Vino Ventus, the wines of the ancient winds. Um, and we're really excited to to um, to to do this tasting tonight. However, you might notice that all four of us are in four different locations uh, for the four winds, uh, you you might say. Um, so usually we try to get at least at least two of us together, but uh, this time we're all we're all dialing in from from different places. So. Um, uh, yeah, but yeah, we're really, really happy to to be kicking this off here and um, and getting an in depth discussion about the wines of this club. Um, opportunity to answer any questions that kind of popped up uh, throughout uh, the throughout the discussion, as well as if you've read through your club write ups or tasted through some of the wines. Feel free to put any questions you have in the chat. Um, at any time, we'll get to them as you know as we as we can, um, and kind of try and weave them into the into the the topics that we're discussing there. So don't hesitate with any questions, um, and we'll do our best to answer them as 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 always. Um, or you're you're welcome to hold them to the end as well, whatever whatever you're comfortable with. Um, but we'll be going through the wines uh, one by one, um, as as per usual, um, with just kind of a tasting and and a little bit deeper discussion about the wines. But um, yeah, so anything else there, Jeff? Did I did I forget anything? Well, it looks good, Ryan. Great. Um, well, let's just, uh, I think we can just get right into it. I think, um, I think we have no, nobody else in the waiting room. So let's just, uh, let's just hop right in. Well, let's see. Oh, by the way, yeah. <laughs> there we go. All right. Um, so, uh, so this first wine, um, for those of you who have it in your glass, this is the 2017 uh, Tenuta de Castellaro, Upsilon, red. Um, from it's from Sicily, but it's actually specifically from the island of Lipari, um, in, um, which is a, an island chain of, of seven uh, volcanic islands, a volcanic archipelago just north of Sicily. Uh, so the blend is 60% Corinto Nero, 20% Alicante de Boucher, and 20% uh, Nero Davila. So uh, we talked a little bit about the um, the Aeolian islands in our, in our write-up and specifically their mythological connection uh, to the winds. So uh, the Aeolian islands, of course, appear prominently in the, in the Odyssey of Homer um, and also in, in Virgil's Aeneid and, and a lot of other ancient texts um, as the home of King Aeolus, uh, who's the king of the winds. And so the, the connection there is that the islands, as you, you might expect, are, are very, very windy. Uh, they're also very volcanic. Uh, so there's two of the islands are, are still active volcanoes. Um, so the island Volcano, aptly named Volcano, and another island called Stromboli. Uh, so they're, I would say that the, probably the three most important um, kind of natural factors affecting wine from the, from the Aeolian Islands and, and what makes the wine unique and special are the, are the volcanic quality of the soil, uh, the wind, which we're, we're gonna look at a lot tonight, uh, and then also just the evident the um, the influence of the sea because you're surrounded on all sides by by water here. Um, so this wine here, um, Upsilon. So if, if you know your ancient Greek or even keeping up on um, COVID variants, um, this wine um, Upsilon is um, it's actually named as you can see from the picture of the bottle for the shape of the archipelago. So the letter Y um, in Greek is is that. Is that shape that you have keeps a lot. So that's actually where the where the name comes from. Um, this was a um, a winery that was founded in 2005 by by a couple of entrepreneurs named Massimo Lynch and Stefania Fratellillo. And a uh, big motivating factor um, for these two was trying to find and utilize uh, indigenous and ancient varieties. So the the most uh, prominent variety in this blend, Corinto Nero. Um, you can probably see the, the name Corinth in there. Uh, it's thought to have been brought to, to Sicily and to the Aeolian Islands by the, by the Greeks in antiquity, um, specifically from uh, around Corinth. So there's a lot of Greek colonization. And um, we've talked about this in some of our other, other clubs and events, actually, but a lot of Greek colonization of Sicily and um, southern Italy and beginning in the 7th century BCE, actually around the, around the time of Homer, which is probably no... No coincidence why, um, actually, sure it's no coincidence why the, the alien islands make it into the, to the, um, to the Odyssey. So, 
Um, really interesting grape, actually, Prince of Merrill. So uh, apart from the name, it's um, it's really a small, uh, thin, thin, thin skin grape, and it's it's a grape that is naturally seedless, uh, which is interesting. And it's um, I don't know if anyone knows this, but it's actually the origin of the word currant, which is such a common descriptor for wine. We use red currant, black currant, um, and the reason for that is this, this grape under the name now um, Black Corinth is, is planted in California. It's the most common grape used for raisins. Uh, and also in the 19th century in, um, in Greece, it was exported like en masse to, to the UK um, as, a, as a raisin basically. So it's kind of a cool, um, you know, those of us who sit around trying to come up with descriptors for wine, current is such a common one. This is where the word comes from, Corinto narrow. Um, and the other two grapes in here, Alaganta Boucher is a um, kind of a bigger, um, bolder grape. It's most famous nowadays, I, I think, just for um, for grapes and uh, wines in Portugal, actually. So it's, it's a hybrid grape that has a bunch of variations, but um, nowadays most famous in Portugal. And then Nero Davila, if you've had any Sicilian wine in the past, you're, you're no doubt familiar with Nero Davila. It's a really famous um, can produce wines of exceptional quality um, grown all over Sicily. Um, and these latter two wines are going to add, both of them are going to add some, some kind of weight and heft and um, texture, substance uh, to the wine. So let's, uh, let's have a little bit of a taste of this. Um, kind of a light purple color, I would say. Um, yeah, we, we really love this. Um, Yeah, a lot of like, I'll say like kind of red fruit, uh, raspberry, strawberry, let's call it red currant, maybe um, just for fun. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, just... some, some minerality, I think you get that from the, from the influence of the sea. Um, one other thing I was going to mention, and um, we're going to talk about this a little bit, it's hard maybe to taste per se the, the wind in the wine, um, but these grapes are grown. Um, these grapes are actually grown on um, what's called the alberello system, which is literally means little tree in Italian. And these are grown. Um, it, it's, it's actually an ancient method. It goes back to the Greeks and Romans. It's, it's used a lot in Southern France as well. Um, Brian might talk about this with the, to protect wines from there, it's the Mistral. And here it's um, the wines just from the Olean Islands being so windy, but this individually trained, um, it's, it's, um, it's called the goble method, I think, as well, but it, it basically the roots go down nice and deep. And so it's, it's a protection from the winds, uh, allows the wine to develop um, full fruit flavor. So I'm not sure if you can taste that in the wine, but that's how they're, they're grown. Um, this wine sees uh, no oak. I think it's all maybe a, a year in stainless steel and then four months in, in bottle. So it gives it that like really light, fresh quality. Um, even though it's in a hot climate, you feel like you're drinking something and a nice, nice light and refreshing. Yeah. What do you guys think, um, Ryan T. Bruno? Yeah, really interesting wine that I think has has like a lot of. I mean, obviously it's Italian, so it has a lot of that kind of like you know, you know kind of nice kind of deep tannic structure to it. Um, you get a lot of that uh, kind of you know brightness, freshness, and from the winemaking. But one of the things you mentioned was like it, it's hard to taste the wind in the wine. What the wind actually do does in in some of these, and, and we'll discuss this in some of the other other wines we taste. Um, and and the, what the wind serves to do to the grapes in the vineyard is actually the grapes tend to thicken up their skins when they're in a highly windy environment. And so in this case, it's when you have, um, you know, a grape like like Corinto Nero or something like that, you're going to you're going to get more tannin development, a little bit of that deeper color. Uh, and so you, so you can you can kind of taste it in there in like structurally, it'll 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 come out there. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, when, when you have things like Alicante Boucher or, and Nero Davila, which can get big and burly. Um, I'm sure that they have to kind of really, really temper those grapes. And they probably don't, um, you know, they, they don't make anything that has over 20% because otherwise you just get a dark, massive wine. But but yeah, for me, I definitely kind of like along that like Chianti Classico kind of vibes of like really pretty red fruits. Mm -hmm. Totally, totally. Yeah, a little bit of pepper too, don't, don't you think? You guys, a little bit of a spicy, yeah. spicy barbecue, yeah spicy yeah herbaceous i mean this is kind of like 
yeah, terroir at its best, right? In the sense of, you know, all the all the descriptors we're looking for. I, you know, it's funny. I I, I keep kind of coming back in my head. It, it almost tastes like Gamay a little bit. Like it's got some lighter Beaujolais sort of quality to it. Um, I wonder, man, and it could also be because where I am right now, uh, here in California, in uh, beautiful Benicia, it's um, it's like 98 degrees outside. I know that's not as hot for a lot of you um, elsewhere, but um, we don't have AC, so it's very hot right now. So I'm 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 wondering about like I would chill this a little bit, you know. I mean, I, I wouldn't hesitate to to you know to have this on a little bit of a uh, of uh, of a cooler day too. So no, just just, just can, beautiful wine, definitely. I, I would say this is definitely a good candidate. Like you said, Dana, like it has that kind of like Beaujolais village kind of like structure, not not like carbonic maceration, like the super like bubblegummy stuff from, from like Beaujolais Nouveau or anything like that. But like, you know, a good Beaujolais, a good kind of well-built one. Um, you can definitely see some comparisons there with like with some of that, that skin, can, skin tannin coming through. But yeah, I mean, from hot areas, like, don't be afraid to stick reds in the fridge ever. I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I feel like we we're like a broken record. We're always saying this, like drink your reds a little bit cooler and like, don't drink your whites as cold as the Rockies. Like doesn't have to be that like, you know, it's kind of classic uh, 1990s sort of dich dichotomy there. Um, but yeah, I mean the, the, uh, you know, it's, it's hot in the Ionian islands. And so I'm sure that they would recommend, you know, sticking it in you know, a bucket of ice for, for a minute to, to chill it down. Cause they get those winds that blow off of the, um, off of North North Africa as well, they get they get Sirocco winds. I know on, in Sicily and and southern, you know, out in the, that part of the Mediterranean. So they these like warm Saharan sandy winds that go up that way as well. So, yeah. T, what do you think about food pairings for this wine? Yeah, I, um, before I get the food pairings, I, I think Ryan and Dana hit it hit the nail on the head. I mean, they aged this wine in stainless steel tanks and. Uh, rather than, oh, because they want to keep it fresh and light and, you know, show the varietal characteristics of this wine. And so, yeah, definitely I would, um, I think it's made to be drunk at cellar temperature, which is like 60 degrees, uh, 58 to 62 degrees usually, um, and slightly chilled. And it's, you know, given how warm it is on the Aeolian Islands at times, I mean, you don't want a really big burly wine, as Brian was saying because uh, that's not going to be very refreshing. Also, it doesn't really uh, pair well with the cuisine, which is going to be more seafood, more lighter dishes, like fowl, um, you know, chicken, like, you know, lighter sausages, like charcuterie, things like that, rather than, um, you know, really big stews or um, uh, strongly flavored red meats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jeff. I don't know if you noticed during, in your research about Corinto Nero that there was um, there's there were some references that that were claiming that uh, Pliny the Elder actually had had written about this grape specifically, and that it, you know it was one of those grapes that was kind of referenced through telephone, you know, throughout the ages from from his era all the way through. Like I, there were a couple sources that I was looking at in the kind of 1400s, 1500s that were referencing referencing Pliny about the grape, and you know it's one of those things that. Who knows? They didn't have, you know, you know, DNA, uh, you know, profiling for any grapes and that sort of thing. But it's one yeah, of those. He called, um, it, um, Mer he called it marine. Well, people who think he connected this grape with the honor grape called it marina nera. I think like mm -hmm. black, black sea. But um, yeah, I didn't find anything that there wasn't sort of just a speculative attempt to to kind of connect. Um, you know, a, a mention from Pliny with the modern variety. Like like you said, there's a lot. Yeah. Um, I mean, a few of them we have probably a little more certainty, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I think he, he I think he talks about how yeah, en enough about it that with the size and the characteristics that might it's not it's not impossible, but um, yeah, it's one of those things like we've talked about in the past with like the grape limnia or something like that, or some you know some of the other other grapes varieties that you know the name could be the same, but it could be actually you know, based on descriptions, based on where it's grown, it could be five, 10, 20 diff different actual varieties. And really only in the last hundred years have we really had this, had this look into it. And so, you know, one, one, one village's Corinto Nero could be completely different from another village's Corinto Nero. And, and it's, um, so, you know, the, the, the history of these things can be, can be fun and can be nice to kind of tie it back. And a lot of wineries will use these sort of historical, uh, and semi-historical accounts to, you know, to, to, to market their wines sometimes, but, um, you know, we have, we have fun with it. It's, it's always, it's always fun, but it's not necessarily always, uh, scientific. 
Pliny, Pliny is definitely connected with the beer, though. I can totally attest that. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, absolutely. Back to the, that's, that's definitely confirmed. So, <laughs> yeah. well, one, one interesting kind of correlated question, that there, there's a lot of discussion about those grapes. Um, a lot of the grapes around Naples, you know, Pompeii um, grapes, and whether or not they're actually Greek grapes, whether they're brought by the Greeks. But um, I do believe the, the um, Jancis Robinson says that the, the, there's actually Leotico is a very close relative to this grape. So that supports the idea that it is, in fact, a Greek import, not a indigenous variety that was just planted by Greeks, which I think, um, you know, Aglianico, I think is a derived from the Greek grape, and, and, you know, and the, the kind of Latin derivation of that. Um, but I, Ryan, I may be wrong about this, but I think there's evidence that it's actually not a Greek grape, but it's an indigenous grape that was then planted by the Greeks, so then kind of got that, that name. Interesting. But, um, but this one actually is, yeah, sort of is green um, as far as we know. So that's kind of cool. That's very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, should we move on to the something also refreshing, right? I would say so. This is hot. Let's, let's... It's hot here too, Dan. <laughs> right. yeah, it's yeah. warming up. Right. All it's right. Nice. So the second wine is uh, the 2020 Marcou Vineyard Savitiano from Attica in Greece. Um, you you probably be forgiven for um, not knowing what Savitiano is, and the fact is one of the most widely planted uh, white grapes in Greece. And uh, one of the reasons is mostly uh, it's so widely planted is because the grapes produce very large plump berries, and the kind of younger Savitiano has a very more neutral flavor, almost like a Pinot Gris. Um, and Savitiano is mostly used in the making of Retsina. Um, it's usually blended with Roditas and Assyrico. And um, I don't know if anyone has had uh, Retsina before, but it has a very strong flavor because it's, it's uh, uh, pressed grapes, uh, ferment, fermented pressed grapes, uh, and they add pine resin to it. So it has kind of a very pine note. Um, it, some people, it, it's kind of divisive. Uh, some people like it. Some people think it tastes like pine salt, uh, but it's very popular in Greece. Um, and Metzina is something you kind of just mostly have on your own. Um, so it's it's a rare occurrence to really have an opportunity to try Savitiano on its own. And th this comes from uh, vines that are over 60 years old. So they're quite old. Um, usually most wine producers, especially in California or the New World, tend to um, uh, replant their vines around 30 to 40 years old, just because uh, even though you get more interesting characteristics out of the grape, uh, the production of uh, how many clusters you can get per vine decreases dramatically. So if you're looking for uh, higher quantity, um, higher grape yields per, uh, per acre, um, you're going to want younger vines. But Marcou Vineyards, they really believe in this variety. And so they let the Savitiano grow until, you know, these are six-year-old vines. And they age it in stainless steel tanks. Uh, there's no, no oak on it at all. And honestly, this is one of the best uh, Savitianos I've ever had. I was very pleasantly surprised just because the grape kind of has a May reputation um, <laughs> among wine aficionados. Uh, but this one, I think, really shows what this grape can do. I mean, I'm getting, when I'm tasting, I'm getting a lot of uh, lemon, uh, there's honey, honeydew, green melon, and it has a really nice soft texture, and there's still a nice acidic backbone to it. So. Um, it's, it's really interesting. There's minerality to it. I get kind of this wet stones, river rocks, uh, kind of like almost like dipping your feet in like a nice cool river, um, on the afternoon. It's, it, and it's a, it's a wine that I think is incredibly versatile. It's, it was eye opening for me to actually taste this, um, this wine. Yeah, some of the other Sabatianos that we've tasted, <clears throat> which is just to, to say maybe like three, I would say three or four over over the the last few years when we've been looking for for Greek wines to to tell stories, 
with um I would say at their at their worst, they're kind of boring and simple. Um, and in this case, this was something that was really, really compelling. It was it, like 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 T is saying, it's 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 bright. It has a lot of kind of a lot of fruit packed in there, um, but some really nice kind of refreshing kind of mineral character to it as well. But um, but yeah, it, it, I think the the point about about Red Cena um, is also is also worth making. I mean, it's one of those things that you know you hear. Uh, you know, um, horror stories of people being served it and not knowing what it is because it's, you know, it got Aleppo pine sap resin in it, basically, and and people then swearing off Greek wine as a whole. They say, I don't like Greek wine because I had this Retsina once. It's terrible. That's what they like. And and um, and, and really, I, we wrote about this, I think, in our um, previous club. Maybe we talked about this a little bit with um, with Wines of the Muses. But um, yeah, Greece is still kind of uh, you know, climbing out of that Retsina, um hole that they dug themselves into, and but I think this, I think you know, rebranding as Savatiano is is um, is, a, is a good angle to take. Yeah. And also, we should also say that there are some really amazing up and coming Retsina producers that are doing you know new spins on old themes and getting away from that overpowering you know sort of pine salt taste. Uh, we've had the privilege of trying a couple of those, and um, yeah, they're they're interesting. Um, in fact, one thing we've talked about is maybe branching out and creating a, a separate a separate club for those of you who uh, you know who are a little more adventurous. Every once in a while, you know, we come across something that we think is absolutely fantastic. You know, something like a native pice from an island in the middle of a river. You know, in in um, in, uh, in where was the pice from, Ryan? It was Chile. Like, from Chile. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, from 110 year old vines, you have to take the take a boat to get to the vineyard. Yeah, these kinds of crazy stories. The, the 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 wines aren't always necessarily uh you know uh you know what's what's the word i'm looking for you know uh, approachable or normal or things that you might not normally kind of associate with uh with, with you know uh your typical thoughts about wine but they can be really really interesting like dana's saying the issue is yeah it's one of context and you said story why wines we can tell stories about right and that's what really this is about so when we when we hear that and we you know taste this stuff and we imagine what's going on at first blush you might be like wait what's going on here but <laughs> when you when you actually get the context in the story um you know it's quite quite a different thing and um yeah so so keep your eyes peeled let us know how many of you like in the comments or send us an email if you'd be uh, interested in uh, some more adventurous off the beaten path stuff too. And uh, yeah, we'll keep that conversation going. Yeah, we, we always try to try, try to try to, you know, uh, toe the line between not scaring people with wine choices, but also, you know, having something that you know, you can you can take to a party and not be like, you know, worried about, uh, uh, you know, get, getting looks from from the host, but also something that is is compelling and is interesting. So, but every now and then, yeah, there's there's definitely, uh, I mean, I I speaking for myself, there's definitely times when I go to the wine shop, and I'm looking for something. I want something that I've never had before. I, I you know, I want that novelty. I want that, you know, that um, that new experience. And but uh, sometimes you want something, you know, more, uh, you know, more safe, a little less, a little less uh, challenging. But yeah. Yeah, I think I think this is a really interesting wine that I I um I, I thought it was it was actually kind of hard to find wines from around Athens specifically. We actually picked this wine also because in the in the story in the narrative that we're talking about with the um we have we have the, the Tower of the Winds and the in the story and the write up. It's it's all this is taking place in 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 and around Athens and but when you actually start looking for vineyards there, there's really not a whole lot of vineyard land that is uh, you know exported or uh, you know it, uh, from Appalachians that you can really get your hands on. So this uh, at Attica essentially is this is this region here that we're that we're sourcing this wine from. And again, a lot of the Sabatianos that we try there, eh, they're not so great. And also in that area, they have a lot of international varieties planted like Cabernet Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, you even see some Pinot Noir, Merlot, uh, Chardonnay, a lot of Chardonnay, and those wines. There's good ones, but they're just for us. It's not as compelling for the story, and also a lot of times they're just you know they're they're they they, they taste like wines that could be made anywhere. And so this is a wine that has a sense of place to it that 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 really kind of drew us to it. Um, yeah. Jeff, any final thoughts on the uh, on the Marcou? No, I agree. Agree with everything you guys are saying, yeah. Well, yeah, this is move. really. Oh, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you guys. Go ahead, Megat. Yeah. Um, no, this is really good. Um, it actually sort of reminds me of a Certico quite a bit. Um, there's a lot more melon, maybe a little bit riper, but that lemon and that white flower thing, maybe a touch less acid too, but it has a lot of similar characteristics. I really like this. Yeah, yeah. Mentioning a Certico, a Certico, definitely a great call there. I think um, you know that there's always that kind of uh, bright kind of 
candied kind of lemon to a to a good acetico with a lot of that kind of you know fresh yellow fruits. Um, yeah, you definitely see it here. And like and like you mentioned, you know, a little a little bit lower acid. Like that's definitely to be expected from from Attica, much warmer region than and less um, you know, coastal influence necessarily than say. Santorini or something like that, where you see a lot of acerticos from. And then I see in the chat there that Mike, uh, Mike Wendy says that remind, reminds us of a semion. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can definitely see that kind of like texture, sometimes almost like you can get a little bit of this, like um, for lack of a better word, like waxy character to Savitiano and to semion. That's a term that you see used a lot where it just has this kind of like soft or a little bit oily texture to it. And you can see how when, if you're pairing it with something as uh, pungent as pine resin, Aleppo pine resin in Verretsina, that it would help offset that a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, I think Assyrtico and Semion actually would be great calls. I mean, if you ever brought a Savatiana to a blind tasting group, I'm pretty sure your friends might throw their glass in your face once you re once you revealed the uh, what wine it was, if you were trying to be uh, tricky about it. But it would be a, it would be a fun one to see. Uh, I, I could imagine I can imagine some some interesting calls and maybe Albarino could be another interesting call for that. Some Pinot, Pinot Gris, Pinot Grigio. Yeah, I feel like Alvarino, Pinot Gris, and you know, um, to to go, Mike's comment that reminds him of a uh, Semillon. I think there's also that green note to it that mm -hmm. Savitiano has, which Semillon definitely has. That kind of meadowy, not grassy is not the white word, but it's that leafy note, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a really acidic melon. Kind of combines all those all those different things. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned a Sirtico to Bangkok because that's like, I mean, we had a little bit about that in our in our write up too. But just the, speaking of wines and wind, right? It's just the, another area that we didn't take a wine from, but um, it was another area that we, we talked to, sure talked a lot about just the way the the vines are trained there, um, in that in that basket shape to keep them safe from from that from that heavy wind. So that's a cool. Yeah, that was cool that was like actually that. one of our top top thoughts for, for first and top thoughts for for wines for this club was a was a Santorini Assyrtico like Jeff's saying and it's just it's it, it it ended up you know we we ended up going with some other wines for, for the for the selection but uh yeah just about as cool as it can get with that with that basket training stuff yeah yeah I got bumped to wines of volcanic islands I think at some point we'll to... indeed yeah wines of the volcano is definitely something that we're uh we're we're still we're still you know we have we're so many cool ideas and and you know you know, not quite ever enough time to do it all, but I think Wines of the Volcano is definitely, definitely somewhere in the pipeline there. And, and, and to that point too, pitch us ideas, guys. If you guys have, you know, you yeah. want to see um, wines of a specific, uh, you know, region period, we're always, always glad to, you know, to do the, to do the legwork and, you know, do the detective work and bring you, bring you what we can find. So. Yeah. Don't hesitate. Mm -hmm. We are all ears. Um, well, should we move on to the next wine? Yeah, let's do it. All right. I'm not sure why your that other slide keeps coming up. <laughs> it just keeps I'm jumping in there. Something with it, like that. That's okay. Blowing on cool. that. Yeah. Well, the next one uh, is the uh, domain 2018 Domain Rouge Bleu Mistral Red Blend. Um, it's from the uh, Coteron Village um, Appellation in the Rhone Valley of France. Uh, specifically, it's from the Saint Cecile village of the Coteron Village. Uh, there's about I think it's 18 or 20 specific villages that are make up the Coteron Village. Um, for those of you who are, uh, I imagine most of you are familiar with with Cote Rhone. Um, Cote Rhone village is, is is actually quite significantly more, let's say, specific or special than than your average Cote de Rhone. Um, it's and a lot of times the pricing is not that much higher, but you do get um, oftentimes much more specific expressions of a certain size terroir. So they can be a little bit more uh, nuanced at, at times. Other other great ones could be, um, there's also uh, Kairen, um, and, and there's a few, uh, like, like Rasto is another great one as well. Um, but the styles can vary pr pretty significantly depending on where they are in the Cote de Rome. Um, this particular one, uh, the Mistral, is 75% Grenache, 20% Syrah, 3% Mouvet, and 2% Roussan, which is a white grape. Um, Blending a little bit like, you know, one to five percent of a white grape is very common in the Rhone, actually. Um, you see it a lot with with in the northern Rhone with Syrah that they blend in some Viognier. Um, blending a little bit of white grape, there's kind of this anecdotal uh, anecdotal evidence, but also I think there is some science to back it up that actually helps to bind color um, and to and to actually kind of deepen the color of the of the red, uh, red grapes, almost kind of paradoxically. 
Um, but this is a, a, a husband and wife uh, team. Um, uh, Caroline is from from Western Australia originally, and um, and I believe his name is Patrick um, is from uh, Alsace. But they ended up meeting uh, in in the in the Rhone, and this is a um, organic, biodynamically farmed vineyard. Um, and again, named after the Mistral wind, that is the persistent wind that blows through the, through the Rhone Valley. If you if you read the write ups, um, you'll you'll learn a little bit more about the Mistral specifically. But this is one of the many named winds of the Mediterranean, um, and it, the, the wine is is you know is very reflective of of where it comes from and the effects of the Mistral, in that you get these. Um, really distinct, uh, you know, depth of of color for a Grenache. I mean, the, a lot of times you see Grenaches in this area and they can be, uh, you know, especially, especially when it's get, you're getting closer to 100% Grenache, the color can be more, almost more like ruby and like even lighter than that. Um, this definitely has some some pretty pretty deeper core to it. And again, speaking about this, the skins being uh, thicker in windy regions, that's really what you're seeing here. Th these effects from... Uh, from these con constant winds really causes this, the skins to thicken up, um, the ripening to slow, uh, and uh, to all because it kind of cools down, serves to cool down the grapes in the evening, um, and you just really get a wine that has a lot more structure to it. Um, this wine was was aged uh, for about two years before release, combination of, of used barrel and uh, concrete tanks as well, just to kind of preserve that freshness. Um, because you can, uh, with a Grenache heavy wine, especially from a warm vintage like this, 2018 was a quite hot vintage in uh, in France, uh, you can have issues where your color can start to drop out. It can get kind of bricky around the edges really quick and kind of oxidize quickly if you don't preserve some freshness and acidity in the wine um, to 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 hold those um, hold those the the anthocyanins and the, and the color molecules. Um, but yeah, so a pretty classic Cote de Rhone here. You're gonna get a lot of that kind of like cracked black pepper, a lot of earth, a lot of plum, a lot of cherry. I mean, it's, for me, it's just plums just bursting out of the glass. Um, you know, summer's coming up here, so it's it's plum season already. I'm already eating plums wherever I can find them. Um, and yeah, it's just a really, again, kind of a more refined take on Cote de Rhone is what you're going to find with a lot of these Cote de Rhone Village wines. Um, good, good, nice kind of medium body to it. Uh, not super, you know, super sweet, but you do get that ripeness from the Grenache fruit as well. Yeah. So take a sip here. Yeah, just a mouthful of red fruits, spices, kind of warming spices, but it's not, it's not super heavy. I mean, I would say, I would definitely say this is just firmly medium bodied for me. Um, the alcohol on this is 14, which is actually, it holds it very well. Um, usually once you get into that 14 range, 14 and above, you can start to feel the glycerol from the alcohol content a little bit more. You can feel that kind of sort of silkier, richer texture, which can be really nice, but higher alcohol can sometimes make it a little bit more difficult to pair with certain foods um, and can also kind of tire out the palate a little bit quicker. But yeah, I think it's showing really nicely. And I mean, this, as far as a wine that has uh, a red wine that has has a wind, you know, name as well as the showing demonstrating the effects of the local winds. Um, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a find a better one. What do you, Dana? What are you thinking? I'm thinking rack of lamb is what I'm thinking. I'm thinking <laughs> like straight. You haven't up. had dinner yet, huh? That, that's another thing. I'm hot and I'm hungry, which is not a good combination. But uh, <laughs> um, no, this is. I mean, yeah, just absolutely fantastic. It it, it kind of reminds me a little bit. I mean, it's still lighter than like what you'd get out of you know like Sardinian Cannonau, which is also Grenache too. But um, it has it, it it's it's very different than you know kind of what we'd see. Um, yeah, it's just just the 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 spices. I think you hit it. I think you hit it on the nose. Um, um, I love this wine and. Uh, I'm thinking what else to pair it with. Yeah, it's a rack of lamb. It's a um my God. Uh yeah, it's sort of like almost like like uh, pork luau. <laughs> Maybe it's yeah, there is that kind of black. like yeah. caramelized sweetness to it that you could you could kind of get into like a like a Kalua pork uh, kind of like sort of thing that, that that Jeff should probably be mailing us on the regular, you know, we should have him FedEx me uh entire leg of, you know pork uh <laughs> pork dinner but i'm just i'm just joking but um no it, it, we actually you mentioned canada that's actually that's actually really interesting cuz the soil types here um in this particular vineyard site is a lot of like uh sort of sandy former alluvial and kind of river stones mm -hmm. um but the 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 sand component actually is 
is uh, reminiscent of Sardinia. They have a lot of those extremely old soils in Sardinia, actually some of the oldest in the entire Mediterranean. Um, they're extremely old geologically, um, the, the sites there. But yeah, you still get that kind of freshness and fineness to it and brightness as well. Um, I mean, when you try Grenache-based wines from like heavy clay soils, again, they can be really just kind of like 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 thick and and almost you know boozy and really jammy and this I, I don't get any of that kind of like overly jammy sort of character to this as well not at all not at all it's really well balanced i, I keep getting this and, and i honestly and i, I just like I'm, I'm probably misreading it but i keep feeling like i'm getting pyrazine on the nose um but i mean it's not coming from cap franc it's not coming from i mean none of the varietals really should indicate something like that so um Again, I think just yeah, that, that could be like the kind of pepper, that like black pepper sort of um, mm -hmm. spices and kind of like her herbaceous quality. So this yeah. is grown in a soil type or in, I should say, soil slash uh, environment type called Garrigue. And so Gar Garrigue is this is this kind of amalgam of soil, of soil and kind of aromatic herbs of southern France and herb shrubs and brush that the winemakers, basically from the Rhone down to Provence and Languedoc and Languedoc and Roussillon, they attribute this Garrigue as a, not only is it a smell, but it's also this, just this kind of sensation that you get um, from wines that have this kind of herby sort of character. And it's not quite green, you know, it's not quite like, like the bell, green bell pepper that you might get from like, you're saying a Cab Franc, but there's something kind of distinctly a little bit herbal about it. Um, you know, like herbs of Provence, Provence kind of, Provence, kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, right. yeah. goes yeah. back to your rack of lamb there. <laughs> that might be where it, that's where it's coming from. Yeah, yeah, it could be a little bit of the black pepper from the Syrah too. If if you get that mm -hmm. spice, I mean, our green pepper, black pepper, are different. Mm -hmm. But I get that. I definitely get that that element of it, spicy. I mean, mm -hmm. I think like just like you're saying, Ryan. I mean, I think finding a and there's just so much Cote de Rhone to find something that's in a you know a good price point that that's an elegant, well balanced wine. It's just that's always kind of a score. Um, you're, you know, you're trying to find something. Yeah, I mean, it's it's something you could lay down for a couple of years too. I mean, there's enough there's enough acidity, there's enough tannin. Um, that's something that I, I think this wine would definitely age for you know three four years something like that. I'd be drinking it you know within three to four or five years. It's not going to obviously go bad. I would just say it would just be you know that's when it's going to be kind of um, you know if you want that little bit of development, that's when that's when I'd be reaching for it. And, you know, it's interesting that Dana mentions Cannonell because, um, you know, dissimilar with Grenache, but also with sand. Um, I think a lot of small producers nowadays in, in, the, in the Rhone are going for more of a more elegant touch rather than the big burly Cote, Cote de Rhone's you had maybe 10, 15, 10, 15 years ago. And actually one of the most sought after uh, producers in the Rhone uh Rhone Valley is Chateau Rias, and they grow their vines on what people consider to not be very good terroir because it was all sandy soils, and they trained it goblet style, uh, just like the Ypsilon, um, and that's the same soil you find in Sardinia, in Canada. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't know there was that Rias connection as well. So that, that's a... Uh, for, 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 um... They they uh, also do you know I mean they make they make amazing wines everything Rios does is is great but um yeah they're 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 one of the kind of preeminent producers in the Southern Rhone for for those of you who aren't 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 familiar with Chateau Rios yeah but yeah definitely a little bit of I would say a change at least in my uh, last five six years of experience with Cote de Rhone or and in the Southern Southern Rhone really has put a great amount of effort into um, to make give, giving the wines a bit more finesse. They had definitely had strings of vintages where every Cote you had was kind of, it might say 14 on the label, but it's probably closer to 15% alcohol. And they were just kind of getting more towards the international style, very jammy. Um, we can thank Robert Parker a little bit for that in the early 2000s when he was giving Chateauneuf to pop uh, that was like 16 and a half, 17 percent alcohol, giving them 100 points, things like that. And so people were trying to get better sc points and scores, and and doing things like a lot, using lots of new oak or kind of faking the oak on their Cote de Rhone's. And yeah, they were, it was kind of in a bad way for a while. Um, I would say they were because the quality of the fruit couldn't necessarily always stand up to some of those um, some of those treatments and some of those uh, decisions being made. But um, yeah, I would I would honestly say that the general trend for Cote, for Cote de Rhone and Cote de Rhone Village, um, especially, 
is is a very positive one. Uh, I mean, if the, the the mere fact that Cotaron village is still adding villages to the Appalachian, like for example, I think San Cecile was added in the last 10 years um, to the Appalachian and you know, for being recognized for having a distinct, um, you know, a, a distinct terroir there. So um, definitely, definitely something that is uh, kind of positive for the region. I'm seeing some head trained vines on the label there, Ryan. Is that that, um... Yeah, those are some gnarly old vines there that, you know, when you get your vines into a sandy, um, you know, a, a, a sandy, hard to grow in soil, you don't want to rip them out because the roots are deep. That's what you that is your your gold is the fact that the roots are down there and they can survive in drought years. They can survive in these also in these windy conditions, um, something that we haven't mentioned yet tonight is the fact that you know why do why do we grow trained vines like low in a basket in santorini or these kind of like short short sort of stumpy styles if you train your vines too high in a, in a region that has strong winds you can blow over entire rows of, vine, of vines especially as they get older they can be very fragile and so you you want to train them low um, I mean, I, I've seen vineyards after a win, particularly windy night in France, and this, these vines weren't even trained very high, but they were old. And you just see them ripped out. Looks like someone just, you know, hooked it up to the hitch of their truck and just pulled it right out. But it was just just the the, the fact that you know the wind was whipping and it caught some of these um, these these vines that had they were full of leaves, and so it kind of acted this little sail and just, psh, just ripped it right out. So keeping it lower to the grounds. Um, and low and gnarly and stumpy, like on the label there, um, you you do a better bet of um, you have a better chance, I should say, of of not getting uh, getting wind damage there as well. Yeah, now we know our gnarly had got its name too. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, California, California Zinfandel, you know, California. the in California Zinfandel vineyards and old California vineyards, especially, you see a lot of these really old, stumpy, gnarly vines, not necessarily from expressly wind mitigation um really just more because they, they they were never trained like uh you know in the burgundian style or like a double guillo where it goes up and then you know goes out like that um so especially for those like heritage vineyards like 100 plus year old vines they're just they're old and gnarly and big stumps there but a lot of times you see them in sandy soils in difficult soils to grow in and, and you can be sure that those roots go down very 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 deep Shout out to Solano Cellars there, our uh, our old alma mater yeah. where we all cut our teeth. The uh, logo at the wine shop in Berkeley, uh, the wine shops in Berkeley is a uh, a big gnarly, a big gnarly vine like the one on the label there. So, yep, it's important. It's, mm -hmm. it's the heart of the vine, of the uh, the whole wine business is the roots of the vine. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, are, shall we move on to move on to the, the next wine there let's do it let's do it um yeah i get to do the bonus wine uh this this club um this was such a fun club to do and uh i always like going last because then i get a little <laughs> i got three glasses of wine in me to kind of do this um so our, our bonus wine uh this this month was the uh was a poship now uh, it's the toretta poship uh special uh, it's a 2020 100 uh, percent poship um this is a really wow. special wine those of you who uh, have been with us for a while you'll remember we did a poship back with the uh, drinking with Diocletian wines of Croatia club. Uh, and this wine uh, is a Croatian wine. This comes to us from the Croatian island of Korčula. Uh, and Korčula is, um, it's, it's, it's one of the, it's kind of, it's kind of a local favorite, right? It's, it's where, um, you know, folks in Croatia will go and where they vacation uh, to get away from the tourists and some of the more popular islands like Vis and Havar. And uh, those of you who have been out there, um, it is just a windswept Adriatic, um, just paradise. It's it's hot, it's arid. These islands are, you know, just just chalk and slate with uh, pine forests that you know are kind of clinging to the sides of the, the rocks, and um, you know and these storms and, and and winds whip up um, sometimes out of nowhere, right? Um, so uh, it's uh, it's a it's a fascinating place, uh, just absolutely beautiful. And Korčula um, has, a, has a has a really long history of of not just um, viticulture but farming. Uh, a lot of um, uh, uh, local um, uh, purveyors of 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 you know fruit tinctures and 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 herbs, uh, all the the kind of this really neat organic food scene uh, that uh, is is based in Korčula, and then they do all of their business in Dubrovnik. Um, 
I didn't have a chance to go there on this trip that uh, that I was there before, but I did actually get a chance to taste some of these wines, uh, which come to us uh, from uh, Franco uh, Banicevio, uh, Cevic, sorry, uh, Franco Banicevic. Uh, so his family um, makes these Corchula wines, um, and they've been making wine. I mean, so wine in Corchula and in the Croatian islands. We talked about this a little bit, but. Um, you know, similar to the Aeolian Islands, uh, you know, there's, there's evidence of viticulture predating the Greeks. The Greeks do end up there, but uh, as early as the late Bronze Age, right, we, 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 we you know, see evidence of viticulture. Um, you know, the Greeks pick it up by the time of Diocletian, right, he's growing his varietals, and you can, you can go back to that club and read all about, uh, read all about that. Um, uh, but, um, you know, more recently, and, and, and when you're talking to the ancient wine guys, more recent, I, by more recent, I mean like 1400, um, you know, <laughs> BCE, as in, uh, you know, the Venetian Empire. Uh, Venice, uh, you know, when it was um, using the wind to ply the seas and, and maintain its empire from Cyprus all the way to the mainland, um, you know, they had control uh, over these parts of Croatia. And they, uh, they actually also... Uh, recognize very quickly how wonderful these soils and conditions are for making for making wine. So if you go to Corchula today, you'll actually see there's a, a big stone statue uh, with the Venetian lion on it and uh, an inscription in Italian that uh, is dictating actually how wine should be made, all the regulations. Um, so, you know, essentially the, uh, the imperial uh, dictorate telling local winemakers what they need to do and what they need to grow. Um, and luckily, um, they paid attention or they didn't pay attention. Uh, what we get out of Corchula are a lot of the, you know, really wonderful varieties that, uh, varietals that are, 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 are that Croatia is famous for, Plavic Mali, um, you know, but this is uh, actually uh, the birthplace of Poship. And Poship as a, as a grape is, um, is, really, is really fantastic. Um, for a long time, it was considered sort of one of these old world whites that, uh, you know, because of its ability to produce a tremendous amount of sugar and its location in incredibly sunny um, and hot uh, arid areas, uh, not so arid, but, but just, just the heat and the sun, um, right? You know, you know where I'm going with this, high sugars and high alcohol. Uh, so it's really a trick to grow poship well and um, Corchula, you know, as the sort of ground zero for Porsche, um, saw its nascence and then now is kind of going through a renaissance of, of new different styles. Um, so uh, so uh, Franco Benicevic, he's been making wine there um, and uh, since his great grandfather. And they named the, uh, the winery, Corchula actually is the name of, uh, of the, the island. I'm sorry, the, the winery is called Toretta, my mistake. I'm uh, mixing my metaphors. So uh, Toretta refers to um, these stone huts, which are on the island that are stacked slate. Um, and what they are is you'll see them in France and other, or other parts of, you know, across Europe. Um, they're shelters and they're shelters for farmers and field hands to, um, to basically take shelter in inclement weather of which there is quite a bit. So back to our wind, our wind uh, um, connection, right? The, the windswept uh, um, islands uh, of, of um, you know, of, of Croatia. Um, so he actually named, he, he's got, th there are only five of them left on the, on the island and all five of them are actually located in his vineyards and holdings. Um, and, and as I mentioned, it, you know, Poshuk gets designated as its own um, appellation uh, in, in Corchula is, is kind of given the, the first appellation of Poshuk as its main grape in, in 1967. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there are different ways now of trying to make a Poshuk that's lighter, that's, um, you know, a little bit more balanced as opposed to these Poshuks of old. So this special um, is a really, fantastic example of that. Um, uh, what um, Franco and the folks at Toretta do, they, they end up um, taking the wine off of the skins. They only leave it on the skins for two hours. So um, we're, we're left with a, you know, a wine that um, is a bit lighter, um, really is um, yeah, fresh and bright. Uh, we can kind of look at this a little more body than what we had with the Savatiano. Um, but uh, eminently drinkable, uh, only 13.3 alcohol. It's, it's a little bit hot, right? Um, but we were saying, you know, it tends to be the case with Poshe. 
but it doesn't it doesn't taste hot in any capacity. Um, you know, it's a it's a beautiful wine for pairing with um, you know with seafood with uh, uh, all the, the the local cheeses you know that are made in Corchula as well. Um, why don't we Why don't we go ahead and taste this sucker because it's uh, yeah just fresh and light. This has been sitting now in the heat for uh, you know the last. 40 minutes and uh, <laughs> a little warmer, but, uh, but still, right. Um, yeah, just, just a uh, beautiful, I get, I get stewed yellow apple, lemon pith, um, and also some of the spices we've been talking about, right. Uh, some like, you know, thyme and, and almost like basil. Um, yeah, just beautiful examples. This is kind of, again, um, drawing from the terroir and um, yeah. Um, what do you guys, what, what do you guys, what, what do you think, Ryan? What do you think of this one? I, I, I really, I really like this wine. And just, just one quick note to clarify, we did have a Toretta Poship in the, the Diocletian Wines of Dalmatia Club. It was a, it was a different, a different wine. So just in case someone's going, Hey, I didn't, didn't we have this one before? This is actually a, a different wine from the one that we had in the, in the previous club, just, just to make that distinction. This one, a little bit lighter. That one was probably going to be a little, like you're mentioning Dana, showing a little bit more of the sugar development that, uh, uh, that, that Poship can do and a little bit more of that like fuller texture um where this yeah this has that kind of like bright like you know yellow apple citrus um i got a lot of like kind of herbs and bright kind of meadowy sort of character to this as well but um a little more a little more a little more zippy and mineral even so than than like say the sabatiano or something like that but um yeah the lobster on the front is a pairing suggestion i'm i'm sure i'm sure there's there's some implied uh you know uh how to uh how to enjoy on the front there with, with that as well but yeah i i, I love this one i thought this wine was like for a uh, summer house white, I mean, it's a uh, uh, pretty much a no brainer for me. We're coming up on white truffle season in Croatia right now. And that's like, yeah, risotto with um, calamari, stuffed calamari with like white truffle risotto or something like that on the beach. And oh, oh, oh. yeah, good. So stuff. you're making that this weekend and I'm going to come have some, right? <laughs> <laughs> we should, you know, yeah, we got to get our recipes going again. Um, <laughs> Sure. Yeah, but cookbook's coming, folks. We'll uh, we'll uh, we'll get the parent cookbook together soon. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Jeff T, thoughts on this one? Yeah, I mean, like, oh, again, it, oh, it's suggestive, obviously, but the the lobster. I think just also the ability to cut through some of that um, butter, cream sauce, you know, risotto you talked about, whatever is in there has that um, great, obviously, great food, great food line. Um, and so many of these lines are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i just think the the texture on this and just i think herbaceousness is such a good call just it gives me like some little bit of tarragon and it's it's a white but it's not just one of these like simple whites that you you know like uh chug and glove kind of white i think i think it has a lot more going to it and so just the texture the herbaceousness the fact that it kind of sits on your palate so the finish is is longer and it you know lingers with you. I think it's really fantastic on this wine. Cool. Um, let's see. Well, there's there was two totally unrelated uh, to the uh, to to the wines. Just two 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 photos I want to stick in that I just I just thought that we we didn't have we don't always have space on our write ups to to put in um to put in as many photos as we like. And there's two just wind related photos that I really wanted to, to just to talk about really quick. This first one is is a, is a really great photo from, this is from Chablis actually. And those are uh, what, what they're called um, smudge pots or in French bougie, which just means candle. Uh, it sounds nicer in French than a smudge pot, but these are candles that um, are, are basically kind of like big plastic containers that they stick out in the vineyard when you have you have a risk of frost in the spring, and the wind is not there. So this is uh, if you if you read through the write up, uh, we kind of talk a bit about obviously there's mythology and then there's the technology of the of the wind. But then we get, when we get into the, the enology of the wind and the viticulture of the wind, uh, it's really about this kind of tension between having too much wind or not enough wind. And this is a case where in the spring, when you have this inversion layer where you have you know you have too much too much a little bit of humidity and freezing temperatures that if you've had a little bit of a warm spell before and your buds are out, your little first leaves are out, your delicate little leaves on your vine, if you get that uh, that freezing temperature, it, it's going to destroy your crop. Uh, and so this is one of the ways uh, that they try to mitigate is by partly by creating 
um, heat in the vineyard and also by creating um, a smoke screen as well. So not entirely sustainable. Um, another way of doing it is burning uh, huge bales of hay in a ring around the vineyard. And you'll, if you drive around in uh, Burgundy, especially uh, in uh, in the April, kind of late March, April, you'll see these huge black spots that, you know, kind of dotted around vineyards. And that's from burning giant bales of hay to create as much smoke as possible because the smoke will help to blow away some of that frost causing um, cold air. But um, every year you see pictures of these um, these smudge pots going out now, it seems. And this is something that, you know, the a lot of the great growers are saying, we never, never used to have to do this. Uh, this is climate change and all these sort of discussions kind of come up every year in this in the spring um, about this because to, you know based on your geography you used to be able to expect a certain amount of wind to blow through these valleys and, and along these hills and sometimes they just they're just not getting it so this is something that they're it's a kind of an active discussion every year right? is it sustainable you know is it worth this cost you know where you might who knows how much it actually can mitigate but um, just something that, that I thought was 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 really worth talking about um, in relation to kind of this too much, too little sort of um, push and pull for for the wind. Yeah, to, to, to add to what Ryan was saying, it, what's really interesting is there's the, a big debate in Burgundy and Chablis uh, about uh, forests around these really famous vineyards because you know as you can imagine, some of these are the most sought after, highest grossing vineyards. In, you know, uh, in the world, uh, most expensive vineyards in the world. So um, as you can see on the top left, you know, there are trees that have been there for hundreds of years. And of course, you know, the natural tendency is if you want to make more money and it's already designated as a Grand Cru or Premier Cru to cut down those trees and plant more vines. But the trees, a lot of winemakers um, say that the trees protect, you know, from these fraught, these uh, uh, early spring frost where you have this inversion layer as Ryan mentioned and you have this cold air that uh, sits down and you're trying to prevent it with these uh, candle smudges, uh, pot smudges and whatnot. So it's a, it's a big debate in Burgundy because you know if, when, if someone cuts down the forest next to you, um, which you think may protect you from frost, you know, uh, well, what do you think about that? Yeah. Yeah, these, these these are like fierce fierce debates and you you and even in the short time that uh you know I was going to Burgundy regularly when I was working for a French wine importer it was every I felt like every time I would go I would be driving down the coat in Burgundy and I would look and I say wow I feel like there was more forests at the top of you know this vineyard in Moray Saint-Denis or in Gervais Chambertin or wherever it was and you look up and you see like, inch by inch you know little bits of little strips of of trees being pulled away and and yeah like 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 T's mentioning you have you have uh, it, it's it's definitely al it's almost to the point where people get you know like like violently angry about it because their livelihoods are being affected long term uh by other people's decisions you know as as T's mentioning so it's really um it's really significant when you have you know when you're facing the like the reality of let's let's say last year in Chablis they lost at least Every, almost every vineyard lost about 50% of its entire crop, whereas the other, and then, and then within that other 50%, it was somewhere around 50 to 75%. So some people lost everything, and some people lost close to 80%. The average was probably somewhere around around half. Um, and so it's getting harder and harder to get insurance for this sort of damage from 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 frost and things like that. So it's it's a really it, it is a it is a really big debate and. Yeah, I mean, and you can also see here, this This is the Grand Cru Hill of Chablis um, here. So these are all like the most famous, some of the most famous Grand Cru vineyards. And um, you, can, you can see there's there's smudge pots in some and not in others. And it really depends on how much money you want to spend. And um, it becomes this thing where, you know, people are spending you know, thousands and thousands of euros for one night, you know, worth of, of burning these sort of things. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's yeah, it's a, it's a tough debate there, but. But yeah, just definitely like you know, one more way where if the wind's blowing, blows all that cool air out. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the next photo that I wanted to stick in here was just something that I thought, what, you know, we mentioned in the um, in the write-ups that I thought was such a cool concept, and it's 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 something that you can still see today. Are we talking about these wind catcher towers that you see across the across the Middle East um, and in 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 Iran? I think as well. I think it's still still quite common. 
um, that, um, yeah, I was kind of, I was kind of trying to pick, pick Dana's brain a little bit about it because it's something that they, you were saying that it's, you know, they find evidence of this going, going back, you know, going back pretty, pretty far, right? Oh yeah, ventilation. I mean, you have, you have housing design as early as the Amarna period in Egypt that's really, you know, being situated and designed to take advantage of the wind for internal cooling, and this is just sort of the, 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 you know, the, the most recent progression of it, and. Uh, I, I think about I think about kind of places like the Emirates, right, where um, this was very, very common in architecture. If you go to Dubai today, and especially the old parts of Dubai, uh, you'll see these kinds of wind, wind catcher towers in different forms. But uh, modern architects in Dubai being, of course, you know, this beating heart of, you know, like modern architecture uh, continue to incorporate this design into, um, you know, into, into architecture in these places where we have wind. And, um, you know, of course that, that kind of goes hand in hand with, you know, the fat, I don't wanna say the fashionability of sustainability in, in more recent years, but it was kind of like rediscovered after the eighties in architecture. And um, it's really neat to see this being incorporated into, um, yeah, into, into sometimes skyscrapers as well. Places like, um, I think there's a, um, Municipal building in in in, um, in Sydney, a uh, government building that uses wind catcher technology to basically cool down the the entire building, and it's efficient. It's there, um, and um, yeah, then it's it's attractive. It's cool. Yeah, yeah. I think I think they look really cool. That's and it was just something that we did, again we didn't have the space to to put in the uh, to put in the image and the write up there, but I I thought it was um, I thought it was it was worth worth showing everybody because it's it's really really iconic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, are there any other questions, any burning questions that are, that are, you know, you've been, you've been sitting on, please, you know, don't hesitate. If, if not, you know, you could always, always stay up to date on our social media. Definitely give us a follow on Instagram, Facebook, um, and, uh, and on YouTube as well. We don't, we, you know, these are all on YouTube. If you ever want to share them with anybody or anything like that. Um, and, uh, you know, we're always, we're always kind of putting heads together about trying to come up with new content, new things to do, but um, yeah, definitely stay in touch. And, and, you know, like if you ever have it again, any question, anytime, feel free to pop it, to, pop it over to us and we'll, we'll be happy to, uh, to have a conversation. Just a quick question about um, your discussion about forests and Burgundy. And I don't mm -hmm. know if this is too technical, but um, how exactly do forests help with uh, reducing the chance of frost? Mm. Yeah, so uh, so in in that case, um, I would say it's it's a little bit little bit less to frost and more on on hail actually. Um, so the, the they actually have a huge problem with hail coming through uh, the valleys in Burgundy. So basically, the way Burgundy is situated, I mean, it, it's a kind of a it's a sort of like a north south sort of sort of uh, well valley against a bunch of hills. They have the the coat, the slopes of the hills. But in between these hills, there's these breaks, these kind of valleys that that come down like this, and that's called the com, c o m b e. And typically, what happens, uh, unfortunately, is you get these storms that come from uh, maritime wind and and moisture carrying air coming from the center of France and coming from western France blows over to Burgundy which is kind of in the central eastern part of France and it blows through a portion of uh of territory of France called the Morvan which is very very few people live there but it's very cold and so it picks up a lot of this cold air but there's moisture and then hits hits those hills of Burgundy and then just dumps hail onto the vineyards and the the problem is is that they kind of these these storms sweep through these combs usually uh, and and basically wherever there wherever there's exposed vineyards it, and usually this is in uh, like early summer, like right around now actually is kind of when they're they're facing these risks when they have they have fruit set, they have you know leaves and these sort of things. Um, now definitely now and then even also in the um, kind of early fall as well, just before harvest, they can get hit too. But the the trees act to actually act to block um, to block those types of storms um, for the most part. It, a little bit less for for frost, um, though there is some sort of uh, I, I I know that there is some sort of insulative effect of having a tree a wind break kind of um, around you in some cases. But then that kind of seems counterintuitive with you know trapping the wind and not letting the wind in. Um, it really depends on on your kind of the microclimate there. Um, so I mean there's there's definitely some vineyards that they're tucked up against all the forest. They're very well protected, but I um, at, the, at the top of the slope. You know, and and then I've had winemakers tell me, that, oh, that's the coldest site in Burgundy, or in, in the whole coat, in the whole coat. You know, at least on this this part here, it's it every every other vineyard 
you know, is fine. And that one will have snow or something like that. So it it's kind of can be a little bit counterintuitive there. But but for the but for the, the trees, the main thing is actually hail in Burgundy um, specifically, because, again, sweeping through and that can destroy an entire crop, you know, in one afternoon. It's 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 brutal. I mean, it's uh, there's nothing you can do about it. There's hail cannons, there's nets, there's all these things you can do, but if the hail's coming, it's just gonna it's just gonna wreck your harvest. So it's I mean, in addition to climate change too, right? Like one of the big issues is of course land is at a premium and you have deforestation, right? As people try to reclaim land and especially in Appalachians that are you know really desirable, turn you know what was forest land into into vineyards. And so then they can sell, you know, because they're part of it. And so that is contributing increasingly to this problem. And um yeah, yeah. So it's it's a bit of a yeah it's 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 tricky there i mean and this is happening in many many places not just burgundy burgundy you know i always talk you, you you'll probably find the, the more of these these you attend that i'll talk about burgundy a lot it's burgundy is not the center of the world so, you know in in wine um it's just i have a good experience there and a lot of the uh attributes of burgundy and a lot of the kind of the, the layouts are you can kind of translate it in to other places. Um, a lot of you, a lot of the um, vineyard techniques and a lot of the reasons that people chose particular sites was because of knowledge gained from parts of France at the very least. From but but Burgundy has been very influential on the modern wine growing practices and wine making practices of the of the rest of the world. Um, one thing we didn't really talk about was the orientation of vineyards. Like for example, on that. Uh, in, in Chablis, for example, that there's, um, you know, certain vineyards, uh, people, when they planted them, they they would go and they would find out where the wind blows from, and then, then they would just orient the vineyard 90 degrees. And so it could be a, an east-west facing or a north-south facing vineyard, and you can have them next to each other. So you'll be walking through a vineyard, and, and they'll just be kind of patchworked, and it really depends on the microclimate of the wind. If someone's trying to capture the winds blowing through one of these valleys um, that you saying, okay, I... I I want to try and harness this as much as possible. Whereas, you know, some some older older vineyards, they they may not have been considering that as much when they're planting it. Or commercial vineyards, they may not have been considering as much. Um, but yeah, the orientation of the vines, um, you know, and it's not just wind. Also, it, it can take into effect things like rain. If you have a lot of rain, you want to orient your vines to a place where they're getting hit with with more sunshine on the later day later in the day to be able to reduce your chances of of mildew so it only takes about six hours of sustained like moisture in uh on a cluster or on in on uh, cluster grapes or on, on leaves to, to actually to start like like downy mildew or something like that starting so some you know sometimes just just even the direction where you plant your vines um knowing where the sun hits and knowing what your rain um and uh wind um, uh, you know, risks are, um, can be, can be pretty significant. Yeah. And, and, and as Ryan said, not have, it's, it's, it's this combination of, uh, almost a Goldilocks thing, right? If you don't have enough wind, um, and the vines get too hot, we, we had a friend, Pietro, who, um, owns a vineyard in, in Lake County and there, if it gets too hot or, uh, coals, um, um, in winery in Sicily, if the vines get too hot, um, if the grapes get, if it's too hot for the vines, the vines start shutting down and they stop sugar production. And so you can get, uh, there was this wild year, I think, I think 2018, where on Mount Etna, you got wines that were, I've had a coast wine that was 11 to 12%, just because the vines just shut down because it was so hot, which is like totally it's just counterintuitive for like, you know, you know, volcanic wine that's at high altitude. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there, there's this, uh, yeah, you kind of need a little bit of both, you know. Yeah, next time you go out wine tasting, you go to a vineyard, ask them about the wind. What's the wind like here? I guarantee you they will talk your ear off. They will They will absolutely have so much to talk about and so many things to tell you. Like, well, the wind comes over that hill there and it's like, and then you're going to wish you never asked. But it's always it's always kind of a funny question to, to ask uh, the vineyard manager specifically. I wouldn't, to people at the tasting room may not know, but people who work in the vineyard, they'll, they'll know. They'll, they'll know where they're getting hit from, you know, reg regularly. It's a rejected title for the club, which was wind. It's not, it's not just hot air. You know? <laughs> yeah. We went through a lot of, a lot of names with this, with this club. Uh, we were, we were, we were definitely, we, could, we couldn't quite, uh, couldn't quite land on something that wasn't 
<laughs> wasn't too much of a pun or too silly or something like that. But um, but we really love this club and we hope you love it too. And we hope you enjoy all the wines and we hope you enjoy the write-ups if you haven't read them. And we hope you did enjoy them if you did read them. Um, and um, yeah, again, stay in touch. And um, unless there's any other questions, uh, we'll just, we'll we'll leave it there and be really looking forward to uh, to our next club, um, which we'll have a teaser out Hopefully in the next next couple of weeks, um, we're we've we we think we've got something pretty fun um, in the works, and um, yeah, though, so keep your eyes and eyes and ears peeled for that. And um, if not, then thanks so much for attending and and for joining us and for being a member and for enjoying what we do. And we'll see you we'll see you next time. So, unless sure. anything else, thanks everybody. Thanks. Have a great evening. Good night all. Thanks.